2 Corinthians chapter 11, and we're going to look at verses 1 through 3. The title of the message this morning is this, Simple, Not Easy. Simple, Not Easy. Living the Christian life is simple. Getting saved is simple. It is. But it's not easy. Uh, uh, surrendering your life to God is simple. It's simple, but it's not always easy. And I want to look at that topic this morning. And by God's help and by His Holy Spirit, may God speak to our hearts and give us what we need. And my prayer, by the way, is this. If you're here today and you don't know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, my prayer is that you don't leave this service before you get it settled. This could be the day of your salvation. You're not here by accident. And if you're here and you are saved, maybe this is the day where you're going to surrender your all to the Lord. There are teens this week, they made decisions, and they said, you know what, God, you heard, you heard a few of them say it up here. For some of them, God's, God touched their heart to preach. That's wonderful. God did the same thing in my heart 25 years ago at the exact same conference in that exact same room. But for some of them, they said, you know what, God, I'll just do whatever you want me to do. That's what you need to say to the Lord. It could be there are church members here. You've never really put your life out in your hands and just said, God, here's my life. Whatever you want from me, that's what I'll do. That's what every one of us need to do. Every one of us, as the pastor where we were, were uh, said this, he said, everybody needs two days. Number one, you need a day of salvation. He said, number two, you need a day of surrender. So it could be there are people in this room, you may have been saved for years and years and years, but yet you've never really surrendered to the Lord. You've never really said, God, take my life, use it for your glory, whatever you want me to do, whatever you want me to be, wherever you want me to go, however you want me to talk, I'll do what you tell me to do. Surrender. Simple but not easy. Let's look at 2 Corinthians 11, verse 1. Paul's writing to the church at Corinth, and he says, Would to God you could bear with me a little in my folly, and indeed bear with me, for I am jealous over you with godly jealousy. For I have espoused you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. But I fear, lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your minds should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. Lord, fill me with your spirit as I preach your word. Lord, remove every obstacle, everything that would be in the way of us hearing your word this morning. Lord, I saw it time and again at the youth conference how Satan would bring a distraction or he'd bring something to try to move our hearts and minds away from your word. But God, you got the victory. And decisions were made and lives were changed. And I'm asking you this morning, God, to remove every distraction. Remove every, way, every wayward thought. Lord, and may our hearts and our, our minds be focused on your word this morning, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Paul is writing to this church at Corinth, and he says, listen, bear with me. He says, I'm getting a little bit upset. I'm a little bit intense about this. He said, because I have worked hard, and I've preached the Word, and I've done so many things to try to present you to Jesus Christ as a chaste virgin, verse 2, what he's talking about is Jesus Christ is the groom, the church is his bride, and he says, listen, church at Corinth, he says, I'm jealous over you. I don't want the world messing with you. I don't, I don't want the world messing you up. I don't want your own flesh messing you up. I don't want Satan messing you up. I, I want you to live a holy, clean life that you can be presented to the Lord Jesus Christ where the Lord can look at you and be pleased with your life. Paul said, I, I've invested too much in you to lose that. He said, so bear with me a little in my folly. He said, I'm jealous over you because I, I want to see you glorify God with your life. You got saved, but that's not the end of it. Now you need to surrender your life to the Lord. And notice he says, verse 3, but I fear. He said, I'm afraid of something. I've invested a lot of time and energy and money and sweat and blood and tears into you, church at Corinth, but I'm afraid of something. What are you afraid of, Paul? He said, I have fear, I fear, lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety. Just the way Satan tricked Eve in Genesis. Genesis chapter 3. Just the way that Satan tricked Eve, he said, church at Corinth, I'm concerned, I don't want your minds to be corrupted 
from the simplicity that is in Christ. Simple, not easy. You know, when I grew up, things were pretty simple. In fact, before my day, they were even more simple. But I think of phones, you know, the, the, the phones when they first came out. How many of you have ever seen a picture of the first cell phone? That thing is about this big and it's got an antenna about this long. And you see the guy walking down the street with this big, huge device next to his head. That was the first cell phone. I, I first got a cell phone. By the way, this teens, you remember this, and kids. Kids nowadays, oh, i got to have a cell phone, you know. I need a cell phone. I got my first cell phone in college. All right, I got my first cell phone in college, and the first cell phone I had was about this big, and it had the little buttons on it, and you know what it could do? It could call people. That's what my cell phone was able to do. It could place phone calls. But did you know now your cell phone can, can book a, t a ticket on an airplane? It can, you can look at things around the world. I mean, your cell phone does so many things. Things have gotten complicated. They're not simple. I think about video games, the old-fashioned video games, Frogger. How many of you know what Frogger is? Yeah, you just got to hop across the street without the frog getting smashed by the truck. I mean, that, that's my kind of game. And uh, I, had the, I had the original uh, uh, game Boy for about three months, and I had to give it up. I was playing it too much. By the way, some of you teens might want to file that away. Uh, when I was a teenager, I was 14, 15 years old. I had that Game Boy, and uh, I played that. It was black and white. I played it for three months, and I realized it was killing my time. I wasn't playing bad games. I was playing Mario Brothers, and I was playing Kirby's Dreamland, and uh, uh, with two little buttons and a little, what do you call the thing with the four arrows? That's what I had. Something real simple, but I was using too much time, and so I gave it up to the Lord because I needed to use my time for better things. But anyway... Things were simple. Nowadays, you've got these controllers. I've got 10 and 12 and 14 buttons. I'm like, I have no idea what to do with any of that. But things have gotten complicated. And I want to say this to you this morning. I want you to understand clearly, God's ways, don't miss this, adults, teens, God's ways are always simple. God's ways, don't miss this. God's ways are always simple. But they're not always easy. Satan's ways are easy, but they are not simple. Let me say that again. God's ways, young people, don't miss this. God's ways are always simple. But it's not always easy. Satan's ways are always easy, but they're not always simple. Let's take something in our culture today like marriage. God's way is simple. You know what God said? Listen carefully. You know what God said about marriage? God's way is simple. He said one man, one woman, one lifetime. That's God's idea of marriage. Let me say that again. God's definition of marriage, which is the only definition that, mar that matters, is one, one man, one woman, one lifetime. I understand we live in a day and age where divorce has touched many homes, but what I want to say to you is this, that that was never God's plan from the beginning. God's plan is that you stay committed to the spouse you're with. Hey, do you, do you ever have disagreements with your spouse? If you do, you know what you should do? You should stay committed to your spouse. Hey, you, you ever have up days and down days? If you do, you know what you ought to do? Stay committed to your spouse. You know your best hope for marital happiness is with the spouse you have right now. Right now. Uh, don't, don't be looking for greener pastures. It's always greener over the septic tank. Don't ever forget that. It's always green over the septic tank. The fact is, you, if you have this false thought in your mind that there's some other man, some other woman out there that would just make your life perfect, you're fooling yourself. And you're lying to yourself. Because the truth is, God's ways are simple and they are right. And God said, I want one man, one woman for one lifetime. That's God's plan. That's God's plan. He wants you to be committed in the marriage you are in right now. But let me say the opposite. Satan's ways are easy, but they're not simple. Satan says, hey, marry whoever you want. Whenever you want. However you want. We've got, and I'm not going to go into that today, but things are complicated nowadays. Satan has complicated so many things. How confused is a country that says, hey, uh, hairy-legged, full-grown men can go in a girl's bathroom. How confused is our country? You see, what I'm saying is Satan's ways are complicated. They might be easy. You just do whatever you feel like doing, but they're complicated and they mess things up. Simple is not always easy, and Satan's ways are easy, but they're not simple. How about the Bible? 
Verse 3, Paul wrote to the church at Corinth, he said, I'm concerned lest your minds should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. He said, just like Satan tricked Eve, the same way I'm concerned for you. Let's look at that passage. Look at Genesis chapter 3, verses 1 through 7. Genesis chapter 3, verses 1 through 7. By the way, I, I hope you're praying for a presidential election. There's a lot on the line in November. And I'm not saying either one of those candidates is the Savior of America. They're not. Jesus Christ is. But I would say to you this. You ought to vote closest to your biblical conscience. You ought to vote for the person that you believe is going to come closest to what the Scripture teaches. That's what you ought to vote. We're going to give an account. In America, we're going to give an account to God for our votes. We get to choose who our leadership is. Look at Genesis chapter 3, verse 1. The Bible says, Now the serpent was more... What's the next word? Subtle. He was subtle. He's sneaky. He's crafty. You know, Satan, uh, uh, adults and teens, he's not going to come to you and say, Hey, uh, just take your Bible and throw it in the garbage can. He's not going to do that. You know what he will do, though? He'll take your Bible and he'll change it a little bit. And then he'll change it a little bit more and a little bit more and a little bit more. And then he'll put a whole bunch of books out there called Bibles that don't all read the same. They're changed just a little bit. And what that does is it sows doubt in your mind about the Word of God. And you say, well, if this thing called a Bible says this, but this one called a Bible says this, well, how do we know what to trust? The fact is, folks, there is one Bible for the, King, for the English-speaking people. It's the King James Bible. It's the Bible we use at our church. There's a reason we use the King James Bible. I'm not mad at you if you don't use it, but I want to tell you there's a reason we stand on the King James Bible. There's a reason every teacher that teaches at this church, every teacher that one day will teach in the Christian school here, every teacher that one day will teach in a Bible college or a Bible institute here, they will teach and preach from the King James Bible. Why? Because it is the Word of God for the English-speaking people. And Satan wants to corrupt the Word of God. He complicates matters. He says, hey, there's a lot of Bibles. No, there isn't. There's one. There's one. The Bible says the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. Notice what he does first. Don't miss this. He questioned God's Word. He questioned God's Word. You know, there are folks that you'll leave church and you'll, you'll go home and you'll say, Boy, I don't know about this and this. Listen, it doesn't matter what my opinion is. It doesn't matter what your opinion is. You know what matters? What matters is what God says. What God says matters. And what Satan wants you to do is question the Word of God. And the question is, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. I want you to see, number two, God's Word was changed. First they questioned God's Word, then God's Word was changed. Listen, you say, what does it matter? It wasn't that big of a change. I'll tell you what it matters. It matters because who tells you which word you should cut out of the Bible, which book you should cut out of the Bible, which chapter you should take out of the Bible? Folks, the fact is, this Bible is the inerrant, infallible, perfect, inspired Word of God. You can count on every word. You know the difference between what we preach and teach and what the churches who say you just use whatever Bible you want, you know what the difference is? None of them will tell you that they have a perfect, inerrant, infallible, inspired Word of God. What they'll tell you is that in the originals, it was perfect and inherent and infallible and inspired. Well, folks, did you bring an original with you this morning? Did you, did you bring the Hebrew text and the Greek text with you? Can I tell you something? They don't exist anymore. Copies upon copies were made from the originals, but we don't have the one Paul penned down anymore. We don't have the actual papyrus and the stone Moses wrote on anymore. Folks, God is powerful enough to preserve His Word, and He did. He preserved His Word to our generation. If you're holding a King James Bible in your hands, you're holding the infallible, inerrant, perfect, preserved Word of God, and you can bet your life on it. You can live your life upon it. That is our stand, and we will not change. Let me say it again. That's our stand, and we will not change. We're going to use the King James Bible. That's it. But Satan wants to confuse matters. He wants to change matters. And so he first asks the question. He questions God's Word. But then secondly, the God's Word has changed. Notice what the next step is. It's just the natural progression of things. 
First people question God's word. Then they change it, but then number three, they just flat outright deny it. I'm so bothered by so-called Christians in the news who say, well, the Bible's a good book. That always throws up flags to me. When somebody says, oh, the Bible's a good book, but, uh uh-oh, here's your billy goat religion. Here comes the but. Watch out. The Bible's a good book, but we shouldn't take it so literally. Oh, that's what God said. He said we should take it literally. We should believe what he said, and we should live by what he said. Notice what it says after God's word was questioned and after it was changed. Verse 4, the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. Wait a minute, did God say they would? Yes, he did. Did God's word say they would die? Yes, they did. But listen, Satan denied God's word. And Paul wrote to the church, he said, Just like your minds were corrupted from the simplicity that's in Christ, I'm concerned for you, lest your mind should be corrupted from that simplicity. I want you to know, number one, salvation is simple, but it's not easy. Salvation is simple, but it's not easy. Pastor, what do you mean? Salvation is this. I'm a sinner. I was born in sin, all of us were. The Bible says, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin. And so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. I'm a sinner who needs a Savior. You're a sinner who needs a Savior. God provided that Savior. Jesus Christ was born as a vir- of, of a virgin, the Virgin Mary, uh, who, by the way, was a sinner who needed a Savior too. And He was born and was laid in a manger and He lived a perfect sinless life. He never sinned one time. He never one time had a wrong thought or a wrong word or a wrong deed. And He began to serve and preach and teach. And then He went to the old rugged cross. And he suffered as no man has ever suffered. You see, folks, salvation is simple. Jesus said there's only one way to heaven. John 14, 6. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. It's simple. It's only through Jesus. John 3, 36. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life, and he that believeth not the Son shall not see life. Say, hey, folks who believe in Islam, they are going to heaven too. No, they're not. No, they are, they're headed straight for hell without Jesus Christ. Why? Because salvation is simple. Here's how simple it is. There's only one door to heaven. It's Jesus Christ. One door. You can't get there through the baptistry. You can't get there by taking the Lord's Supper through religion. You can't get there through your good works. You can't get there through Islam or Catholicism or any of the other isms or wisdoms. The only way to heaven is through Jesus Christ. It's simple. But it wasn't easy. Let me tell you how hard it was. It was so hard that Jesus Christ had to be beaten with a cat of nine tails. Where his insides hung out and his flesh was in ribbons as he took the stripes of our sin upon him. I'll tell you, it was, it's simple because it's only through Jesus, but it wasn't easy. As they took a crown of thorns and put those thorns on his head and then took a reed like a club and beat his head and beat those thorns into his head. It was simple because it's through him, but it wasn't easy. Don't ever say salvation's easy. It wasn't easy. It wasn't easy. It was simple because it's only through Jesus, but it wasn't easy as a big Roman soldier grabbed Jesus' beard and put his knee in Jesus' chest and ripped his beard out of his face. That wasn't easy. As Jesus walked up that business district, that street called the Via Dolorosa. As he walked carrying our cross, our sins, on his shoulders. As that splintery cross dug into his wounded open back. And as he wore that crown of thorns. And as he was marched naked and shamed through the streets of the city. And as all the people would come out and mock and scorn those condemned to die. And throw stones at them and spit upon them. That was not easy. As he collapsed under the weight from his blood loss, and they had to call a man named Simon the Cyrene to come help him carry the cross to the top of Calvary, that was not easy. As they laid him out on the cross at the top of Calvary, and they took the spikes, the big nails, and the hammer, and pounded those nails through his hands and through his feet into the cross, that was not easy. As he hung on the cross, the Bible says all his bones were out of joint. That was not easy. 
as he hung there with all the sin that we've ever committed. You think of every sin you've ever committed. You think of every word you've ever said that you shouldn't have said. You think of every deed you've done that you know was sin. You think of every thought and even the things we don't even realize that are sinful about us. And all that sin, all that guilt, all that shame, all that pain was placed on Jesus Christ at one time. So much so that as he hung on the cross, and he had he who had never sinned one time, he who had always pleased his father, he said, I do always those things which please the Father. As he hung on that cross, he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And as he looked to heaven, perhaps for one bit of encouragement from his father, he didn't see the face of God. He saw the back of God. He saw his own father turn his back on his son. Why? Because God cannot look upon sin. And Jesus became sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. It was simple. It's only through Jesus. It's simple. There's one door, but it's not easy. Jesus paid the price. And he said, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He had to turn his back to pay for our sins. He gave up the ghost as he did. He said, Father, he said, into thy hands I commend my spirit. And he said, Tay, to rest I, it is finished. Salvation is simple. If you're here this morning and you're lost without Christ, you're in your sin. Salvation's simple. It's not through church. It's not through religion. It's not through a preacher or a pope or a nun. Or it's not through any religious uh, or, or, or ordinance you can do. It's only through Jesus Christ. It's simple. So I said, I, I don't believe in easy believers, and I absolutely do. The Scripture teaches it. Look and live, my brother, live. Look to Jesus now and live. Come to Him with all your sin, with all your guilt, with all your hang-ups, with all your problems, and Jesus paid it all, all to Him we owe. You just humble your heart before Him and trust Jesus Christ. He'll save you today. Salvation's simple. It's only through Him it's not easy. He paid a heavy price. He died three days later. He rose again. And He promised He'd save anybody who would come to Him. I want to say number two very quickly. Surrender is simple, but it's not easy. Surrender. What is surrender? It's that moment as a Christian when you're already saved, when you not only are saved, but you also say, Lord, whatever you want from my life, you can have it. Like what many of these teens decided this week, they surrendered their lives to the Lord. Well, when you think of surrender, what do you think of? You think of a white flag. You know what you've been doing? A lot of Christians you have been fighting God. You saved, yet so as by fire. You saved, and you're going to go to heaven someday, but you've been fighting God with your life. You're on the battlefield against God. God's trying to work in your life. God's trying to get you to live a holy life, but you're fighting against Him. God's trying to get you to listen to His word, but you think the preacher's mad at you, so you fight against Him. The preacher's not mad at you. The preacher's telling you the truth. You're fighting against God, and you know what you need to do at some point? You just need to go... All to Jesus I surrender, all to Him I freely give. Lord, you want me to give up that practice? Okay, Lord, all to Jesus I surrender. Lord, you want me to win souls? All to Jesus I surrender. Lord, you want me to stop going to this place or stop dressing that way or start doing this or start doing that, start being faithful in church? All right, Lord, I surrender. I surrender. Who am I? You win. You win, God. You know what some of you need to do today? You need to put your flag up and go, God, you win. I'm tired of fighting you, God. I want to fight with you, God. You win. Surrender. See, we don't belong to ourselves anyway. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter number 6, verse number 14, the Bible says, Be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers, for what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? And what concord hath Christ with Belial? By the way, that's what's so wrong about Christian, so-called Christian rock music. Uh, do, do you know anything called Christian beer? Have you ever bought any Christian beer? So, oh, there's some Christian beer down at the store. Did you know lost people know Christians shouldn't drink? 
Well, let me, let me say that again. I'm here getting quiet. I'm since I'm on to something here. Lost people know Christians shouldn't drink. Did you know that? Lost people know that. I've been asked by more Christians to drink than I have by lost people. That's a shame. It's a shame. Listen, the two don't mix. Light and darkness don't mix. Christ and Belial, they don't mix. Music that sounds like the devil's music but has some Christian words, they don't mix. Had a fellow guy, I've told you this before, had a fellow got saved about five or six years ago when we first started. After he'd gotten saved about a month or so later, he came to me and he said, Pastor, he said, I didn't realize something. He said, I've been listening to a Christian group all along and I didn't know it. Wait a minute, red flag. You were not saved and you got saved when under the preaching of the Word of God. And all this time you've been listening to a Christian group, so-called, and you didn't even know it. There's a problem there. You see, we as Christians are not to be yoked together with unbelievers. We're not to have communion between light and darkness. There is no communion. You're going to compromise. You're going to give up to the darkness is what's going to happen. Verse 15, what concord hath Christ with Belial? Do you think Jesus and Satan would get together and have coffee together someday? No. What does he say? There's no concord between Christ and Belial. Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. Your body is the temple of God. When we think of coming into this church and bringing some things into this church building that we wouldn't, that we see out in the public, no, there are things we wouldn't bring in here. Why? Because this building is sacred. Do you know your temple, your body is sacred to God. Your body is the temple of God. And the Lord said, as God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them and be separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. God still wants his people separated from the world. Listen. Why? Because our bodies don't belong to us. Look at 1 Corinthians 6. You're in 2 Corinthians. Look at 1 Corinthians 6, verse 19. The Bible says, what? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own. For ye are bought with a price. What price? That price Jesus paid. You're bought with a price. Christians say, well, I just I live my life how I want to live. And you're taking that which does not belong to you. Why? Because you're not your own. You're bought with a price. That price Jesus paid. Well, pastor, it's just not comfortable for me some of these things that we should do or shouldn't do as Christians. I mean, I grew up doing those. But can I remind you of something? You were bought with a price. The moment you got saved, you transferred ownership. No longer did it belong to you. No longer was your life yours. To do with what you want, it belongs to the Lord. And by the way, let me say this. God will never abuse your life. You want the most happy, blessed life you can be? You're wise if you surrender it to God. You're foolish if you think you're going to get the most out of life by living how you want to live. But if you'll say, God, all to Jesus, I surrender. Lord, if you show me it in this book, I'll do it. Lord, there's something I'm doing I shouldn't be doing. Show me, Lord, I'll stop. Lord, there's something you want me to do. You show me and I'll, I'll, I'll do it. You'll never go wrong. You'll, you'll find what true happiness in life is when you serve the Lord Jesus and you surrender. I've mentioned this illustration before. If you went down and bought a car, you signed the paperwork. They gave you the keys. They said, listen, this car is yours. Enjoy it. It belongs to you. But every Tuesday and Friday, we want you to bring it back to us so we can use it how we want to. You'd say, well, excuse me? Well, see, it belonged to us before it belonged to you. And we're kind of attached to it, too. We like the car, too. You'd say, no, I bought it. It's mine. I'll do with it what I please. Can I remind you folks, as Christians, we were bought with a price. We belong to the Lord Jesus Christ, and we are to have not only a day of salvation, but a day of surrender. Listen, a lot of times it's not that you don't know what God wants you to do. Let me say this. It's not that you don't know what God wants. It's that you don't want to do what God wants. It's like the man who came to D.L. Moody's service. He said, I can't come to Christ. D.L. Moody said, don't say can't, say won't, because you won't come to Christ. Salvation, it's simple. It's not easy. Surrender to God, it's simple. 
It's just saying, God, okay. You tell me to go this way, that's the way I'll go. But it's not easy. You know what has to happen? Just like Jesus had to die on the cross, there has to be a death. You say, what death, Pastor? A death to self. Paul said, I die daily. He said, I crucify my flesh every day. What does that mean? It means some days you're not going to feel like doing what you ought to do. Hey, Christians, how many of you feel like going to church some days? How many of you feel like reading your Bible or feel like living a holy life? If you just do things when you feel like them, you're going to be up and down. But if you do things because you know what God wants you to do them, you'll live a life of surrender. Last of all, number three, soul winning and service for Christ. It's simple. It's not easy. Everybody I know of gets nervous when they think about talking to somebody they don't know about Jesus Christ or somebody they do know about Jesus Christ. But I think just even this week of these teenagers, uh, you, would have been, you would have rejoiced. You would have been challenged. You would have been challenged if you watched them. Take those gospel tracts. Just walk up to people they've never met in their lives. Can I give you one of these? You've been challenged as you saw them talking to people about Christ. You know what? They were doing the will of God. Soul winning and service for God is simple. You know what it is? It's just a matter of doing it. The Great Commission, it's simple. It's just a matter of doing it. But it's not always easy. You have to crucify the flesh. You have to die to self. Let's bow our heads together, please. Hi, everybody. This is Tim DeVries, pastor of Vision Valley Baptist Church in Mount Washington, Kentucky. And I want to thank you for watching our YouTube channel today. Our desire is that the world know Jesus Christ as Savior and that in this generation, His people will be faithful, uh, courageous, bold witnesses for Him. I want to say to you, if you do not know the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, God loves you and wants you to know for sure that you have a home in heaven. In order to know for sure you're saved and that you're going to heaven, the Bible tells us we need to know, first of all, that we're all sinners. The Bible says in Romans 3.23, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Because of our sin, we don't measure up to God's glory. God is perfect, we are not. And sin keeps us out of heaven. Secondly, the Bible says, for the wages of sin is death. The scripture says, the soul that sinneth, it shall die. Revelation 20, 14 and 15 says, and death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. You're going to spend eternity somewhere. And because of our sin, we don't deserve heaven. Unfortunately, we deserve a devil's hell. But the good news is this, that God loves us. And because He loves us, He made one way of salvation. It's not through a church. It's not through a religion. It's not through doing the best works you can do. The only way He made to get to heaven is through His Son, Jesus Christ. Jesus said this, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by Me. And in Acts 4.12, the Scripture says, Neither is there salvation in any other for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Jesus came to this earth. He was born. He lived a perfect, sinless life. The Bible says in Romans 5, 8, But God commendeth His love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Jesus took our place on the old rugged cross. He was crucified, buried, and rose again to pay for our sins. The Bible says the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Jesus today offers you a free gift. That gift is eternal life. Heaven instead of hell. And if today you're willing to trust the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. If you're willing to call on Him today to save you. The Bible says that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus. And shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised Him from the dead. Thou shalt be saved. Romans 10.13 says for whosoever shall call. On the name of the Lord shall be saved. Would you call on the Lord Jesus Christ right now to be your Savior? If you will, He promised He would save you. Feel free to contact us with any questions. We want to help you grow in your walk with Jesus Christ. God bless you.